welcome to the third and final seminar in Southampton's Faculty of Arts and Humanities Advanced Semar Seminar Series 2020 and 2021. This seminar series is on pregnancy, birth and motherhood. We aim to bring researchers working on relevant topics across and beyond the arts and humanities into conversation with each other and with you, the audience. If you missed previous seminars, which were on pregnancy and on motherhood, do note that a recording is available on YouTube or Facebook. Today's seminar focuses on birth. We're going to explore representations of birth from the past to the modern day with experts on how birth is portrayed in medieval romance, in the early modern stage and in film. We're going to look at agency during birth in both art and reality. And we're also going to explore what happens when women want to give birth outside medical guidelines. In our panel today, we have Kirsty Bolton from English, who's going to be talking about women's agency in the birthing room in medieval romance. We have Anita Sikora from politics, languages, and international studies and music, who's going to be talking about birth on the early modern stage. We have Sophia Bull from film, who's going to be talking about representations of birth in television. And we have Elslyn Kingma from philosophy and Lisa Smith, a, consul cons a consultant midwife at the Princess Anne Hospital in Southampton, who are going to be discussing birthing outside the guidelines. Welcome everybody. We're going to begin today with a panel discussion, which is going to last until 11.05. Then we're going to have a break of slightly under five minutes and return at 11.10 for a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, we're going to invite you to send questions or comments for the speakers to respond to. You can submit questions and comments through the chat functions on YouTube or on Facebook. However, if you have any problems commenting this way, you can also send questions using the Contact Us form on the Southampton Human World website. I'm going to begin by asking our speakers to tell us a little bit about themselves and their research. So, Kirsty, could you start, please? Of course, Fiona. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, my, I'm a PhD student um, in the English department at Southampton. And my f thesis focuses on how women characters enactment of motherhood interacts with socially constructed spaces in 12th to 14th century French and Middle English Romance texts. Um, my overarching argument is that gendered space is a complex negotiation of rights and agency aiming to benefit a social equilibrium and that Romance texts Romance texts interrogate and disrupt that negotiation, but ultimately aim to uphold it. Uh, one of the spaces that I analyse is the birthing room, uh, which is a historically documented space in elite households throughout the medieval period. Um, I argue that the birthing room in medieval elite society exists as a space of women's agency due to contributions that women produce within that space. In arguing for a feminist approach to geography, Gillian Rose explains that feminist geographers insist that reproduction is as important a part of a social and economic life as the sphere of production that geographers have traditionally explored. Um, I argue that medieval literary texts also apply this approach in their own terms and that they recognise women's contribution contribution to a patrilineal society and advocate for their autonomy in this area despite a deep masculine anxiety concerning women's authority over the birthing room. Um, I focus specifically on two Middle English texts which are Octavian and Amare and two French texts which are the Romain de Silence and the Romain de Melusine. Um, in each of these texts the birthing room is intruded into by a man which ultimately results in the family unit being destroyed. Um, in both Octavian and Imare, the Paturiant mother is accused of adultery and mother and children are banished from society. In the Roman de Meliacene, King Elenus breaks his promise never to look upon his wife um, in childbirth um, and she disappears with their three infant daughters. 
Um, in the Roman de Silence, there is an accord between husband and wife who use the birthing room as a private space to discuss their plans to raise their daughter as a son and to contravene misogynistic inheritance laws. But their family is still torn asunder when the truth is revealed to the adolescent silence. These texts imagine what happens when the gendered space of the birthing room is breached by men um, and the repercussions that it has for a patrilineal society. Um, when men enter the birthing room, cha birthing chamber, disaster ensues, um, lineages are disrupted and the smooth running of territories dependent on primogenitive um, succession is imperiled. Thus, these romances advocate for the continuation of women's agency within the space of the birthing room, despite masculine anxiety. Um, they don't call for a radical feminist overhaul of society, but they do suggest that women are left alone to get on with what only they can do. Um, thank you. Uh, Anita, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah. Hello. It's a delight to be here and present you some aspects of my PhD research, mm -hmm. which focuses on motherhood in 18th century opera from a literary cultural point of view. And in this context, I study the life and the roles of a particular performer, singer and actor, uh, Bargarita Durastanti. In 1721, she gave birth to a daughter in London and the circumstances of her confinement will play a role in my second thesis chapter. Here I would like to mention accounts of birth, birth and breastfeeding in opera, as well as changes in birthing that occurred in the, that period. Birth and breastfeeding as animalistic activities, here I'm referring to a letter by Queen Victoria, do not feature extensively in opera. It is breastfeeding that has clearly more appearances. It features dramatically in the most popular opera in the 17th century, Il Giazzone by librettist Ciconini and composer Cavalli. It features two women, Medea, the sorceress, and Isifile, in love with the same man, G Giazzone or Jason, both mothers of twins by him. In this context, Isifile's breastfeeding, which is embedded in the opera's plot and its metaphorical language, marks her as the more motherly and caring of the two women. There is one opera character in this period that was associated with birth, Queen Zenobia of Armenia, mentioned by the Roman historian Tacitus in the 17th century. There is a libretto by writer Bontivoglio describing the moment of Zenobia's first labor signs on a dramatic flight with her husband when she asks asks him to be killed by him in order to avoid rape and slavery. There is focus on her pain and her longing to unite with the soil under her feet, described in a language that suggests association with Mother Earth. I fall into the womb of soil, into the breast of grass. That's my translation of the, of the Italian original. Culturally, the period, period around 1700 started a significant change for women as the invention of the forceps brought men into the birthing chamber. Earlier, a soul realm of women, as we have seen in Kirsty's account, in which, in, which, uh, in this um, uh, realm of women, the midwife often had a motherly role, especially in Italy. According to Filippini, the task of an Italian midwife involved more than helping the child to come into the world. She took care of washing and swaddling the child. In the countryside, she cut the baby's frenulum in order to ensure breastfeeding. It was also the midwife who was present with the newborn in church during the christening. christening. While the mother was absent due to purity reasons, she even had the power to christen the ch child herself in emergencies. As one source suggests, in Italy, midwives used to use the birthing stool, a signifier of their profession, longer than in, any, in other countries, such as France, where the reclining position was the norm at the end of the 17th century, so very early on, as Dundee's point out, points out in her study. That's my introduction, and I pass on to Sophia. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Sophia. I'm um, a film studies and television studies lecturer at Southampton, and more generally, my research is uh, focused on sort of discourses around science and medicine in uh, popular television, primarily. Um, I've most recently published a book 
called uh, Television and the Genetic Imaginary. I'm going to plug that. <laughs> um, and in it, I have a chapter which uh, focuses on uh, the representation of assisted reproduction technologies and, um, and sort of uh, issues with conception uh, in, in TV, sort of writing history on that and looking across multiple genres, um, sitcoms, reality shows um, and stuff like that. But uh, I've also published previously on, more specifically on sort of childbirth in television and, and on um, a particular strand or cycle of um, medical reality shows, uh, which sometimes is referred to as birthing programs or birthing shows, um, focusing often on uh, either women who are pregnant and, and, or the birthing process or on uh, midwives as a profession. Um, so in the study I've done, I specifically compare Scandinavian uh, programs. I'm Swedish, but I'm uh, comparing um, some, some Swedish, Danish, and uh, Norwegian shows with uh, more long-running programs from the US and uh, from the UK, looking at sort of different discourses around uh, female agency and um, ideas about uh, sort of natural childbirth. Um, and I was interested in doing that because if you look at the American programs, which are the ones that have been studied most extensively, um, they're often setting up this, this really sort of stark opposition between a medical model for childbirth and, um, and, and, and what is sometimes called the natural birth model, right? Um, but the Scandinavian shows, so I think, so, so that opposition between those two models are very much there both in the American programs, but also in the reception of the programs. And they've been very heavily criticized for being sort of too, too medicalized, uh, portraying childbirth as, um, as a medical emergency that requires a lot of sort of medical in intervention. And that's something that um, different types of, uh, of, of sort of academics, academics from different traditions have seen as uh, problematic in different ways. That, reading that work, um, I felt that, you know, I think it's very much capturing what is going on in the American tradition of this type of program, but not so much what was happening in the Swedish shows that I had watched. Um, and and to, to an extent also sort of the UK programs, pro programs like Born Every Minute and the Midwives. Um, there's also interesting links between the UK programs and the Scandinavian programs because they're modeled on each other. Uh, it sort of both ways, um, the Scandinavian traditions and the UK traditions are sort of feeding into each other. Uh, so what I'm arguing in the article that I've published on this is that um, the Scandinavian programs in an, quite an interesting ways are like blurring the lines between the medical model and the, the natural birth model in, in ways that I think um, both shows that then show that sort of from a feminist point of view, they're not um, necessarily so oppositional. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't view them as so oppositional. And that these shows at least have some sort of potential to both um, make us aware of the pros and cons in both models, in a sense, that when it comes to sort of uh, female agency. Um, and that they are, you know, enabling us potentially to see the empowering potential in medical practices, in, in, in pain relief, um, but also um, even when they're celebrating uh, natural birth and the natural, uh, natural approach to birth, making us aware of some of the more problematic sort of essentialist ideas around femininity that sometimes uh, saturates the, the natural birth model. Um, so I'm, I, as a film and television studies person, I look a lot at, I sort of study the way that cinematography and editing um, feeds into this. So not just um, sort of 
what is happening, not just the plot <laughs> or um, the portrayal of the women and midwives, but uh, how the sort of form of uh, the television programs are constructing these ideas. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. So next up is Elslein. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, my name is Elsa Lenkingma. Um, I'm a professor in philosophy. Um, I have a, quite a number of research trends <laughs> that are related to pregnancy and birth. Um, so I, I investigate in metaphysics of pregnancy or the nature of pregnancy, which is about the relationship between the fetus and the mother, or really question what this mammalian state of pregnancy is. Um, I also look at questions in uh, ethics of pregnancy and birth about the um, uh, rights and obligations of pregnant women. Um, and more broadly, I'm interested in quite a few of the questions that have already been mentioned, issues to do um, with autonomy, issues to do with how we think about birth and organize it in our systems. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Dutch, so I grew up in a, in a kind of a a slightly different approach to pregnancy and birth than um, some other countries take. Midwives in the Netherlands historically have been very prominent. Ho home birth is just a normal feature of the uh, of the maternity offering and not a, a kind of a radical choice or anything like that. Um, so there's a range of things that here that, that interest me. But I was going to particularly highlight uh, a bit of research that I've done in relation to the rights of pregnant women who want to give birth outside of the guidelines. So this is an uh, item that sort of came up in the Netherlands um, in the last decade and caused a lot of um, anxiety in the um, in, in um, the medical professions, the obstetricians and the midwives, um, uh, down to court cases uh, about pregnant women who might have, uh, who have had a pregnancy that was deemed more risky or too risky, too dangerous to, for example, have a home birth. Uh, and these women wanted to give birth at home nonetheless. So, you know, they might be expecting twins or they might've had a cesarean section previously or the baby might be in breach. These are all cases in which um, uh, midwives and obstetricians and their guidelines will strongly advise the pregnant woman uh, to give birth in hospital under monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, because there's certain things that can go wrong. I mean, there are always things that can go wrong, but the chance that things go wrong is higher in those cases than if you if you have none of those kind of um, risk factors. Uh, and some women didn't want to comply with that. And that caused uh, a lot of stress and anxiety. So there were questions about, well, how um, law-like are these guidelines? Uh, can healthcare, I mean, some people even questioned whether women could make these choices or whether they could be forced um, to go to hospitals. Um, there are also questions about whether when healthcare providers assist them, whether they are doing something wrong, because, you know, a midwife attending a home breach birth is kind of practicing outside what is laid down as the norm for her discipline. Um, but of course, the, the fallout from some of these cases were that when um, healthcare professionals said, no, we're not going to help you. Or when they indicated that they might try and force the pregnant woman to go to hospital, um, kind of things broke apart further. And some pregnant women would say, well, then we're not gonna phone you when I'm in labor or fine, I'll give birth on my own. And then of course, things are even more dangerous, we might say. And also it meant that pregnant women, you know, had less opportunity to maybe change their mind or figure out that, at some point during labor, which happens regularly, maybe they would like care or they would like to transfer in. So uh, I spent quite a lot of time thinking about what the kind of underlying moral arguments are that really, I think, justify healthcare professionals in assisting the, uh, women who want to make these different choices you know, which are arguments that are partially about, you know, the right of women to make these choices. It's their body. They don't have to submit to medical treatment. Um, and on the other hand, you know, arguments that when healthcare professionals, you know, have made every effort, of course, to communicate and explain the risk. But when they do things that they would normally consider bad practice, you know, because pregnant women exercise their right to refuse more invasive medical treatment, then they're still doing the right thing. And so, you know, they both ought to go out there and support these women. And also they should do so without fearing, because that was happening, without fearing legal repercussions or judgments from their fellow healthcare professionals. Um, and so one thing I was quite interested in is, you know, I've been doing this work sort of in the Netherlands where, you know, there's been quite a lot of 
relatively public. I mean, it's made it to newspapers, but certainly in a profession, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, and, you know, one question I sort of have is, well, what's being done? I mean, these women don't just exist in the Netherlands. What's What happens in other countries, in other jurisdictions? How do healthcare providers deal with these kind of questions? Which I think probably um, can make me hand over to Lisa. Hi everyone. Hi, my name's Elisa Smith. I'm a consultant midwife in Southampton and I've been doing this role now for about three years. Um, so one of the main aspects of my role is I get involved in birth planning, so helping to support women with their birth options um, with a whole range of um, different considerations and um, what Elselin would sort of describe as perhaps outside of the guidance. So um, we, we draw from national guidance. So, um, so NICE uh, gives us a list of risk factors we need to consider. But I think nationally, probably there's a quite a lot of difference between how units apply those um, guidelines. And I don't think there is a national list of criteria for birth centres, for instance, or criteria for home birth. Um, that, that doesn't exist. So we, we kind of individualise care as, as far as possible. Uh, that's the idea anyway. We're bearing in mind the risk factors that someone may have. So um, I had about 750 referrals last year to talk to women about their birth options. Um, bearing in mind about 5,200 women give birth in Southampton every every year. So that's quite a large number of women who were being referred for discussions. Now, many of those uh, women were um, actually wanting further discussion about birth options after cesarean. So um, in Southampton, we have a midwife-led VBAC pathway, which is vaginal birth mm -hmm. after cesarean. So um, their own midwives will counsel them about the benefits and risks and what they'd like to do. So uh, I would generally only talk mm -hmm. to the women who perhaps are unsure or mm -hmm. are pretty certain they want to plan a cesarean and then we can get that booked in. Um, the, the other women that I would talk to are perhaps women maybe wanting to give birth in a community setting so, such as at home or um, in a freestanding birth center in particular who, who may have some additional risk factors that we need to sort of factor in. So perhaps a common one might be a previous hemorrhage for instance or where there's been difficulties delivering the placenta last time, might suggest that there are some risks of recurrence there that we need to consider. Um, other risk factors include bacterial infections like group B streptococcus, uh, which can cause severe infections in newborn babies. So we need to sort of consider that and, and plan for that. Um, BMI, uh, so women with a raised BMI, um, different thresholds, um, and it sort of corresponds with with um, outcome based re research that that shows that women with a raised BMI may may have more complications um, uh, following or during labour and birth. Um, but increasingly, you know, the, the most um, I think the, the growth in referrals has actually been about women who would like to have more intervention than we'd perhaps recommend. So healthy women who uh, are having a healthy pregnancy with no complications, who would perhaps like to have induction of labour, who perhaps would like to be cared for in a high risk environment with additional monitoring that in itself increases the is associated with an increased chance of interventions in labour and many women want to choose a cesarean birth without a medical indication as well. So there's a whole range of conversations I have on a week to week basis and I perhaps talk to sort of 10 or 15 women a week, um, all kinds of requests. So very interesting job from that respect. The other aspect of my role is um, getting involved in clinical governance. And I suppose that's a bit of an overarching term for um, writing guidelines at a local level. So we'll, we'll do that as a bit of a team effort, um, pulling together some of the latest research or national guidance that, that is released um, to sort of consider how we implement those locally. Um, and education as well, so supporting midwives with their education and training. 
and um, support as well. So perhaps after a, a, a difficult birth experience, we might have a discussion about um, what what was what, what was the experience like from their point of view, and and whether there's any learning that can be identified. Um, I also get involved in safety reviews as well. Um, so perhaps for an unexpected admission to our neonatal unit of, you know, a, a woman we were expecting to have a pretty straightforward birth, a baby goes to the unit, that that's, requires a bit of consideration about what's happened there. Or a mum who's maybe required intensive care admission after giving birth. Um, and I, I'm also involved in the research agenda here at Princess Anne Hospital as well. So people who are exploring the feasibility of research in maternity and whether it's kind of doable. Um, and I'm in kind of like the final throes of completing my PhD, writing it all up. I've done some research about outpatient induction of labour. Uh, from the midwife's point of view, so views and decisions about outpatient induction. Um, which, you know, I can talk more about presently. So back to Fiona. Thank you so much, everybody, for your uh, wonderful descriptions of your work. Um, now we're going to start with some questions. So uh, first I'd like to ask Anita. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the difference which social position might make to um, experiences of birth? Uh, in the period that you study. So how much does the birth of a court lady, for example, differ from the birth experience of a non-aristocratic non woman? Okay, yeah, thank you. In the, in the, early, uh, in the early modern times, ladies of high birth, in particular those giving birth to an heir and especially to a king mm -hmm. or um, had many witnesses uh, looking into her, her into their birthing chambers, or even witnesses present in the birthing chambers themselves. So uh, she was a little bit on a stage, and the the uh, the the whole thing, uh, the whole reason behind it was that it was uh, everyone feared that a baby could be substituted uh, for a healthy baby or for a boy. And they and they were more likely to give birth in the yeah. horizontal or in the reclining position. Uh, something very likely brought about by King Louis the Fourteenth. He was very interested in uh, birthing. He he. It was one of his hobbies to look to watch women giving birth, and his um, apparently his uh, his uh, his lovers um, at. at uh, he wanted to see them as well. So, and it was, uh, it, he was a bit annoyed by the birthing stool because uh, it doesn't show anything if you are on a birth seat. <laughs> That's what some say. So, uh, some uh, st um, uh, scholars say. So, he had, a, but he had a profound effect in France on the way birthing. Uh, on birthing in general and once uh, the lady the court lady or the, the 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 princess or the future queen had born the male heir it was very likely that he was taken away from her so we say we have that so with a girl they could stay for a few for a, for a few weeks and so on and even there is a closer relationship but with a male heir very very likely that uh, she will never see him or very rarely and in the in the early months, yeah. So that was a bit tougher for the court ladies and the high uh, ladies of quality. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I, I have no idea that we could blame Louis for <laughs> <laughs> women giving birth on their backs. <laughs> um, yeah. and Sophia. So I have a question for both of you. Hmm. Um, so both of your work focuses on different art forms um, yeah, and in different time periods and I'm interested in who the audience is for these in each case and how the interest and in, you know the, the type of people engaging in um, this looking what uh, in consuming art about um, birth has changed over time so Kirsty maybe you could tell us a bit about who the audience was um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, well, the audience for these um, romance texts changes over the, the period that I'm uh, studying um, in the in the 12th century. It's a very courtly audience. Um, so they're written um, 
for patrons, um, kind of princes, dukes, kings, um, queens, um, it, within the court for a courtly audience. So it's a very small um, small audience of, of like-minded people. Um, and towards um, the 14th century, um, um, especially in the, in the, when you're moving from French to English, um, the audience becomes um, a gentry audience. So you have um, kind of high, I guess you'd say upper class um, and, and high middle class, if you want to compare it to today. It's people with professions, with businesses, um, with, with land, um, but they're not royalty, they're not nobility. Um, but they're they're emulating the royalty and the nobility. Uh, there's a the, there's a, it's an aspirational literature, um, but they're also um, quite um, they comment about, upon kind of these class divisions. Um, so there is a kind of all the the romances are about what happens in castles in courts, um, but but there's a lot of um, Kind of negotiation and uh, disruption of of the kind of class hierarchies. Thank you. And what about so? Yeah, what about? Okay. <laughs> well, so it depends slightly, I think, on um, the different national contexts. Potentially, I mean, you, I mean, a blanket statement would be that they're mainly addressing a female audience, um, but. I don't think that that necessarily means, I haven't seen any actual uh, viewing figure statistics when it comes dividing it into gender or say class. Um, so the, assumption I'm, the assumptions I'm making is, is about sort of how the, um, the programs are promoted, like what channels they're on and what target audience those channels typically have, right? So um, when it comes to the US shows, uh, these kinds of programs have tended to be on networks that are traditionally mainly addressing female audiences like um t like tlc is one of the big sort of birthing show that is which is sort of geared towards reality uh programming in general and particularly sort of female focused uh reality programming but discovery channel is another um is another outlet which has more of a a mixed audience in terms of male, male and female um, address. In the Scandinavian context, they're um, they're on they're mainly on sort of uh, public service channels, and they have much more of a sort of educational address, mm -hmm. which which is is potentially a little bit more neutral. That it's it's sort of um, also maybe indicates that they're trying to potentially address a wider segment in terms of age so that uh, younger people who might be interested in childbirth can watch it um, and learn things, so to speak. But I would say that often um, there's an implication or an, or an assumption that the, the people that are going to be most interested are women and perhaps women that have themselves experienced childbirth or who are, who are about to or who are interested in having children <laughs> at some point in their lives right um i've i've taught um one born every minute uh for for a few years in the uk and that has been interesting i mean this is not a <laughs> not a, um, a scientific study by any means but talking to my students about it it's been interesting because um it's definitely been the case that that a fair share of them were aware of the program and had watched the programs, but specifically together with uh, often their mothers, and that the mothers have, have had insisted on sort of uh, the, the both ma both male and female students sitting down and watching like an episode of us in a, in a sort of educational, um, um, uh, yeah, kind of a, a idea. So um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, that's 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 really interesting. I like the idea of it as, as you know, education for the young, maybe putting people off. Yeah, I, I, I think the idea that it is, that they're supposed to be educational is one of the things that people have been worried about. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that there ha you know, in in the media, these shows have um, 
been met with a certain amount of sort of um, distrust or uh, anxiety that they will that they will sort of misinform the viewer and precisely because they're potentially presented as being educational but not somehow then able to do that uh, well enough you know yes I can see the concern yeah. <laughs> yeah. actually we've got all the way to the break I was very keen to have um, Alslin and Lisa uh, have have a discussion to hear them talking to each other. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for that after the break. Um, see how many comments we have if we have time for that. We're going to take a short break now, and we'll be back at eleven ten after the video. So uh, see you all on the other side. Hello, welcome back to the second half of our seminar on birth, part of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities Advanced Seminar Series on Birth, Pregnancy and Motherhood. So, uh, as we, we, we are uh, looking forward to hearing comments and questions from you, the audience, if you do have a comment or a question, then uh, you can, um, uh, put it in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook, 
or if you have a problem commenting, then you can send your question using the contact us form on the Southampton Human Worlds website. Uh, so to do that, you go to humanworldsfestival.com forward slash contact underscore us forward slash. So that's humanworldsfestival.com forward slash contact underscore us forward slash. Now, while we're waiting for those comments and questions to start rolling in, I was very keen to get Elsa Lane and Lisa into conversation. So, um, Elsa, what would you like to ask Lisa? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, so, Lisa, you gave you know a really great description of um, uh, the kind of conversations you have with women who. I mean, I also don't like the term outside guidelines, <laughs> but um, I, I was just wondering, because obviously I came into this topic, you know, at the very extreme end, and many of the cases you described, probably in the Netherlands, also just get resolved. They certainly don't end up in court, um, you know, a group B strep or um, women who previously hemorrhage. So the things that really got things on edge was women making decisions that people felt put their future baby at significant risk you know which is i mean the, the cases i described the the the, the, the breach or the previous area and the concern about a uterine rupture that's really what the result of the standoffs i mean i just i guess i wondered whether you'd had any cases like that or whether you just hadn't encountered it and whether you found that that you know whether people meant to meant to manage to resolve that or whether that caused these some of these issues that i described you know with anxiety and things amongst the healthcare providers Mm. That's a really good question. I think that, you know, nationally, certainly that there, there are cases where th there is a, there can be a breakdown in the relationship between women and, and the care providers um, because of the, you know, the, the discussions often repeated over and over again about the risks and that pushes people away, doesn't it? And, and so, you know, I think it's important to try and get a team around um, women or a birth in person who wants to make those kind of more more risky choices um, f from our point of view of course it may not be risky to them the biggest risk might be coming to the hospital from their perspective that they might have had such a dreadful experience last time that the last thing they want to do is step inside the door here um, so, yeah, I mean, nationally, there have been cases like this where there's been a breakdown and perhaps uh, people have opted to free birth instead. Um, but as I say, we we try to keep doors open and carry on a discussion. Um, and it's nice to have, if we can, facilitate it, continuity of care. So the the individual isn't having to repeat their story over and over again. And I, I think that's that's where... Um, those continuity of care teams can be really helpful um, in ensuring that we're really listening carefully to women and roles like consult midwives um, in, in other trusts, it, you know, the, the work I do is undertaken by other midwives with different job titles, but generally it's a, you know, a consultant midwife kind of role that we can pull in expertise from you know, different um, backgrounds, perhaps a neonatal doctor, perhaps an obstetrician or an anaesthetist to make a bit of a plan together. That's the idea. But it, it rarely gets to that kind of level. From my perspective, we don't see an awful lot of really difficult situations like that where I'm, I'm anxious that a relationship is breaking down. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 good. I mean, it's I mean that's good. <laughs> I mean, it's also interesting to think of the role of the consultant midwife. So this came up earlier, right? I said I'm kind of interested in the way that birth systems are organised, and we have this history mm -hmm. that got mentioned of like, you know, this opposition between different models. Um, I've never thought of the way that in the in the UK, as a consultant midwife, you're just you know, you're part of the hospital, but you're still a midwife. That role doesn't really exist, I think, in the same way in the Netherlands. So you, you, there's, there's slightly more of a opposition there as well, where, you know, you get more of a, well, the midwives might be doing that. And then maybe the hospital thinks, well, I better have a chat with this woman and then I'll mm -hmm. be able to convince her. 
Um, so maybe you have a more integrated approach that helps with a lot of these these issues. Um, yeah. I feel we should, we should I, I don't want to take up too long though, but that is very interesting. Um, I, we've, we do have time. Um, I, I just want to ask one thing. So Elson, what, uh, what Lisa said there about risk, um, I understand that you've done some, some work on uh, what risk actually means in pregnancy and how to assess risk in pregnancy and how our judgments about what a choice is risky might not be so straightforward. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. <laughs> what, in one minute? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure. I've done I've done that much work on it. Well, I mean, I mean, there's often, there's often, and I think I think Lisa alluded to this. Right, risk is always. I mean, risk is many things. Risk can just be, you know, the kind of thing that, um, uh, you know, an economic. What do you call these people? People who work with spreadsheets call risk right. It's just a kind of a clean, quantifiable calculation of a chance and a negative outcome. But I think in most of our talks, risk often means something much more intractable where you know it's it's a danger to be avoided regardless of how high it is or you know to say something is risky is to say it's a bad thing to do or a bad choice and in the context of birth these things get very tricky because i think the way so one thing i've certainly looked at is the way that we frame things that happening happen to fetuses or future children i should say babies babies still inside about to be born babies. We frame those as risks, and that comes with a kind of red flag, right? Like avoid. And we frame the things that happen to women as interventions or in terms of benefits. So we talk to so the risk of a home birth to the baby, but the benefits of home birth to the mother, and we never talk about the risks of a hospital to the mother, because as Lisa said, right? A hospital birth has many benefits, so I don't want to deny that, but it is associated with all sorts of increases of damage happening to women. And the moment you have this, you know, the moment you start phrasing one thing in terms of risks, but the other thing just in terms of benefits or interventions, you know, you really, you really affect the way people psychologically think about these cases. Um, you know, we're much more risk avoidant than we're keen to get benefits. And the effect of that is, is I think that we tend to, um, on the way or overlook or not 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 weigh in our decision making things that happen to women and that can be a a, a serious risk <laughs> i think there's a constant balance in maternity care between and, and you hear it said um you know too much too soon and too little too late um that we're concerned we might miss something um, but equally, you know, as you alluded to, it, the intervention sometimes will get minimised. Let's pop you on the monitor, just hop up on the bed, let me do this. You know, it, so I, I think it's very easy for those those risks of um, perhaps continuous fetal monitoring, um, to, which we know can be associated with increased likelihood of, of um, interventions in labour, those risks can be can be minimised. And so, it's, you know, that's really important that we're being really balanced in our conversations with with families that there are benefits and and there are risks and there are alternatives. So that that's where we try to individualise care. But I know how anxious midwives and obstetricians and neonatal doctors get precisely about those risks that you're talking about, Elselyn. Yeah, I think it's really... I interrupt, sorry, we have a question now from the audience. Um, so this is a question for Lisa, which I think is clearly inspired partly by Sophia's research. So picking up on the connections between uh, those two. Uh, so it's from Zoe who says, do you see any correlation between programs such as One Born Every Minute and the increased number of women opting for more medicalized births? Absolutely. I think talking to women every week about their wish to plan a cesarean birth with their first baby and they're having a healthy pregnancy, I will often ask them what their perception is of you know what 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 labor and birth is is like and of course we all hear birthing stories from our families and friends um as well as tv shows like one born every minute and i think one born every minute they you know you 
see the the shot of pulling an emergency buzzer and lots of people coming in the room and then stuff being done to you as as a woman and being whisked along to the operating theater so it's it's very interventionist isn't it and it's the, i think that definitely definitely um i see that in consultations every week with people that um there's a perception that something will go wrong and you know in the wider media as well we see it in the press every week about you know difficult birth experiences scandals in other maternity units so it's no wonder that we are seeing this rise in requests for cesarean birth Sophia, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I think it's interesting because um, this is clearly, um, you know, I, uh, you, you hear this a lot from from sort of midwives and and uh, and other people who who are in, interacting with women that that they are um, that they are clearly. Or that people that women that come um, to to give birth and feel anxiety or fear refer to these programs, right? But what I think what's interesting is that if you if you look if you if you follow the program, <laughs> a program like One Born Every Minute over over time for a long time, like if you watch all of it, those those instances of childbirth as an emergency are actually quite rare interestingly like if you, you you know a lot of the program is just like really sort of childbirth or something quite every day it's like a, a absolute majority of that program is just people sitting around sort of drinking tea while waiting waiting you know like you know like it, making it making it seem like quite mundane really but the first couple of seasons had in their opening sequence they have this sort of opening montage, have shots of sort of people midwife, running around the corridor. People running around the yeah. corridor, yeah. Um, and there are clearly, you know, like episodes uh, where women vocalize a lot or scream a lot <laughs> or are expressing anxiety, right? And it's interesting that that is clearly affecting people more. It's like they're remembering those flash of, <laughs> uh, of of sort of emergency or danger or pain uh, more than they're remembering uh, what is actually makes up sort of the majority of the program which is which is not not that so that's I think that's really fascinating and something to do more um, thinking about certainly. Because I think it would also be problematic if these programs were just, you know, <laughs> were just showing childbirth as completely <laughs> painless or, yeah, you know. I'm really interested to hear more about your the, the Scandinavian TV programs, because mm -hmm. in maternity, we always look to Scandinavia. They have great outcomes. And so it's really interesting to hear that, you know, more of a collaborative approach in care planning and less of a distance between women and their families and, and the obstetricians mm. and, and how that's portrayed in that show that you were talking about. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the biggest differences as well is just uh, a term on, uh, in terms of narrative structure that one born every minute um, tends to still have this quite um, dramatic narrativization of birth where it always ends in childbirth as this sort of um, dramatic end moment you know when the baby comes out and is put on the chest um, and then it ends and you don't get to see any sort of aftercare or, or anything but um, the, the Scandinavian the, the, the first one called the Barn Morskona, the midwives, um, didn't follow that at all. They they don't follow individual births. Um, they don't focus on individual births. They might have like, you know, shots of a childbirth at the beginning of an episode and then just end on something completely different. So that so the, like the drama somehow of creating this strong narrative around individual labor and birth 
is not really there. And I think that has that is interesting. I think that has implications for how people perceive it or read it. Um, I think Anita wanted to come in here. Yeah, um, yeah. That I remember when I was pregnant, we had a sort of a meeting of mothers, and then we were talking about presentation of birth in uh, in fictional TV, and it's always the drama that stands mm. out. There isn't the, the normal, the calm birth is never there. But a uh, here called the midwife is obviously something that comes in because it 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 has a broad appeal here in Britain. I just wonder if there are some intersections there or some great differences because. It's not the cesarean birth that is in the center. It's the, it's the sort of un, the home birth, in fact, that's more portrayed sure. there. Are there any? Yeah, please. I, I don't hear so much mm. from mm. the women and their families about mm. the influence of Call the Midwife. Mm -hmm. I know it's a show that I think midwives like it. You know, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a time before there was so much documentation that there is mm. now that, um, mm. uh, but still challenges and lots of mm. really great stories around good public health mm. messages and, mm. you know, um, edgy topics. Mm. But yeah, I see less of an influence from my mm. perspective of, of Call the Midwife. Yeah, which is a, was a, a pity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so did you have thoughts on Paul the Midwife versus One Born Every Minute? Yes, so I, have, so I haven't actually written anything on Call the Midwife. So there's quite a lot of interest in, um, in sort of feminist uh, television studies in that programme, or at least there, there were. Um, I, think, I think it's, it's um, it has this, this added... Um, complication of being a period drama, right? So that potentially mm -hmm. uh, there's, for, for a viewer, it's a possibility to, to sort of slightly remove <laughs> oneself by saying, you know, like, but that mm -hmm. whatever is happening there is not sort of what's going on in the present moment. Mm -hmm. But clearly there is a, an appeal in somehow it's it's so long running as well, and you follow the characters of the midwife for, for for such a long time. I mean, one of the things with one born every minute is that there's a you know there's there's like two or three women giving birth, um, in every episode. Each season tend to follow tend to focus on one hospital, right, or a team of midwives. So you do get to know them a little bit, but not very much. Mm. Whereas uh, called the midwives as a sort of serialized um, drama that has run for many, many seasons, really allows the audience to sort of connect with those, with those mm. characters of the midwives and, you know, make you feel that sense of trust and closeness <laughs> and like continuity of care to the, to the viewer potentially, right? Mm. <laughs> um, that you don't get from uh, reality-based programs as much, I would say. So I'm going to move on because we have another really, I think, interesting question. Very uh, timely. Uh, so Sarah asks whether Elson and Lisa, and of course we'd welcome um, others uh, commenting, um, could comment from their perspectives about the, the recent court ruling forcing a woman to leave home to birth due to ag agrophobia. So I think, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this case. Uh, are you aware of this one? No. 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 Well, I, I am... I am a little. I am only a little bit. So I try to get more detail on this court ruling. So mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know if the person commenting can chime in. Uh, yeah, it's a case where a woman who had agoraphobia was given a court order so that she could be removed from home to the hospital to give birth. I can't remember whether it was under sedation or not. There have been quite a few court cases that are, in my eyes, surprising. Um, there was also one where, yeah, advanced... Oh, well, never mind. Um, but the tricky thing with these court cases is that, you know, you see a news report, it's very brief. And so I try to get more details on this case, but it's really difficult to find out what's going on. I believe that in this case, the concern was that during the labor, if there was a problem, 
the woman might not be willing to leave her house because of her agoraphobia. And in, I mean, so, you know, there may be details in this case that we don't, like, we don't know about. Uh, so, you know, I've only got, well, I can only speak about what we got, so I want to be really hesitant about committing to anything here. But I think in general, there are two things that stand out, right? So one thing that kind of stands out is just the fact that we are willing to impose court orders on women to undergo treatment. That is a very extreme thing, and it's particularly extreme. So we don't do that in general medicine unless somebody has mental incapacity. We don't force treat. And what's interesting about birth is that we often then end up force treating, not for the person themselves, but for their future child. <laughs> like we're treating, but force, forcefully treating one mm. to save somebody else. And I don't think we would do that. We wouldn't force somebody to give up their kidney for somebody else, not even mm. for their child. But suddenly with birth, we think it's okay. The other thing that's really striking in these cases is risk, right? So as Lisa said, you know, there's quite, there's, there's a number of risks associated with giving birth in the hospital and you know the risks of birth i mean they're there but they're also lowish right so in this case somebody wants to have a home birth as far as i know there were no other complications the chances that she really has to go to the hospital on that high things may well the majority of birth things go fine but we focus on the risk that she might have to go to hospital and then the risk that when that happens, she might not agree to go to the hospital. And then the risk that, you know, because often when we move things to hospital, we're still being really precautionary, right? I'm sure Lisa will confirm okay. this. You know, most of the time it will still be okay, but we just want to monitor. So, you know, it's quite a small risk, but that gets to complete, you know, completely dominate the court narrative. And just to guard, and this holds for a lot of cases, against that quite small risk, we're willing to do quite atrocious things to women. And what we don't then consider is, the risk of the hospital, but also like think of the risk of the trauma if you're agoraphobic to be forcefully removed from your home by your healthcare. You know, there's a huge number of additional risks that are kind of increased. And often in these court cases, that doesn't seem to give any weight at all. So I've read another court case where, uh, um, you know, there was authorization to sedate a woman and like give her a cesarean under anesthesia, which she didn't want. And then the judge sort of said, oh, well, I reassure myself that lots of women are happy to have cesarean. And it just completely steps over the trauma and the invasiveness of having this gone to you against your will. That whole aspect, right? Lisa said that there's always the weighing. That aspect of the weighing just disappears. The only thing that comes to dominate the story is that, you know, in that case, the quite small risk that something goes wrong and that if something goes wrong, the women might not comply. Um, so again, I don't know the exact details of the case, but those are striking features, I think, about these court cases. But Lisa. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it, it kind of reflects you know, the, the, the headline in, in the media. What it doesn't tell you mm. is probably the, the discussions that, and multidisciplinary meetings that have happened in the run up to mm. this. I'm, I'm sure no hospital would be wanting to get to that kind of level of intervention of in, involving a court um, to ensure that someone gives birth in a hospital. I'm sure that there would have been, and, and usual processes would be, there'd be a lot of discussions beforehand involving, you know, I don't, I don't know the case. I'm afraid, but it it, it may be around some aspects around mental capacity. Is is just thinking about other sort of cases that there's concerns that someone may may not be able to make decisions in labour, um, but certainly it it reflects a really sad situation, doesn't it? Where obviously there's great fear and concern of something going wrong, and Elselin, as you say, the chance of it actually happening, maybe, maybe very small indeed but we we i don't know the the matters of the case sorry yeah i i, I do well, agree that. i don't know the matters of the case so you know i don't i don't want to on that I note the whole case before i comment it so on the, on that note um so we've just had a comment from rebecca who uh, is i think the author of a series of blog posts on this case on the open justice court of procreate uh, protection project and the link is going to be posted in the comments by her so thank you very much for that Rebecca I was just actually I was going to mention it that myself because 
I think that's a very interesting insight into the uh, procedures that have followed and the discussion that's been had. I'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions. So um, try. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to answer quite, quite briefly and concisely. So our first question is an interesting one about um, breastfeeding during COVID. So um, has lockdown helped or hindered breastfeeding for new mums? Uh, mums have had less support, but less interference from family who might have varied views on how to feed your baby. So that's from Rena. Um, do people have views about that? I suspect Lisa might be the one with the most um, experience, uh, direct experience of that. But if anybody else wants to come in, do you feel? I think um, from our own experience, we looked at whether there were whether there was an increase in readmissions and to, to hospital because of weight loss after giving birth over the COVID period and admissions to our neonatal unit, and there didn't seem to be any impact which is extraordinary. Uh, I don't know about the national picture, it may be different, but of course, in this day and age, I think there's a real culture around inviting people into the into the home to see your newborn baby and to celebrate. And anecdotally, what I was hearing from our you know, community staff was actually people were getting off to a really good breastfeeding journey. Uh, and um, undoubtedly there were people who were struggling who were finding it difficult and then finding it difficult to access the support they needed so we had to work quite hard with the triaging um, to identify people who needed the help um, I know our breastfeeding uh, midwives did some virtual support as well so they'd um, do use like attend anywhere virtual appointment system where people would say well this is my problem can you watch me feeding mm -hmm. so yeah there was a lot of change in the way we support people but anecdotally I was hearing we we usually weigh um, breastfed babies around day three um, and then again on day five of life and typically by two weeks of age they they will have lost a little bit of weight and regained it all and um, anecdotally people were saying the babies weren't losing so much weight um, but yes, that's just us locally. Nationally, I'm sure there have been difficult cases where people have been finding it hard to access support and, and perhaps required readmission or a poorly baby because of it. I think it's 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 kind of really sad that um, it should require a national lockdown for um, people be, being able to get the time that they want with their, with their baby, that they shouldn't feel confident and able to say I need space um that it should There's take so many obligations to... Fiona isn't mm -hmm. there though I mean I suppose it's you know everyone wants to come and visit the newborn and it it, it, it is disruptive mm -hmm. in 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 the home and and the, around the baby's feeding practices potentially can I one minute left and I need to just very briefly uh, say we had a question that we didn't have time for um, but I thought it was a, I just want to read it out because I think it was a really interesting question so this was from Anne who said that there seems to be a distinction I wanted to ask whether there's a distinction between physical and phenomenological risks i.e the psychological and bonding effects of a negative although physically safe birth and Anne said, it seems to me that the push for medicalized births aims at minimizing the former. And although I wish that we could have time to discuss that, because I think it's a really interesting thought, I just wanted to make sure that we I read it out before we finish. Can and I put 20 I, seconds about it, Fiona? Sorry? Can I say 20 seconds about it? Uh, you, 10 seconds. Is, 10 seconds. Yes, yes, I think it is much easier to focus on the physical risks and that a lot of the psychological after effect, long term effects are much more difficult and we tend to underestimate them, not think about them. They're not as easily measured. So that fits into those weighing problems mm -hmm. that we discussed. Thank you. That was admirably, admirably brief. Um, so we have 30 seconds left. So I just want to say a massive thank you to all our speakers. You've all been brilliant. I've really enjoyed exploring this. I could talk for another hour, but we are out of time. So thank you very much. 
And um, I don't know if you all want to say goodbye, <laughs> um, but goodbye <laughs> from us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And Good thank night. you to the audience for all their great questions. Mm -hmm.